Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session. I'm David Schlesinger, the editor of Reuters, and it's my pleasure to host today's debate. The title, of course, is Success Versus Survival in a Global Downturn. There are many people who would say the first definition of success really is survival in a global downturn, that uh, no one ever celebrates the companies who disappear and fail, nor should they. So clearly, in a downturn, the first thing people do is they like, cut spending, they shed staff, they pull back from ambitious plans, they concentrate on their core. All these things make perfect sense. All these strategies have dominated executive committee meetings for it seems like forever. But having stabilized the patient, having safeguarded mere survival, thoughts of any good executive have to turn to the future, have to return to ambition, and have to turn to being successful instead of merely continuing to exist. But how to do that? What strategy should you take? And what does it really mean? So let's spend the, few, the next few minutes exploring this question. We have a wonderful panel to, to talk about that. We have uh, Pramod Basin to my left, who's president and CEO of, of GenPak. We have uh, Yoshihiko Miyayuchi-san, the chairman and CEO of Oryx. We have uh, Vivek uh, Renadiv, chairman and CEO of Tibco Software. Sir Martin Sorrell, chairman and CEO of WPP. And Wang Jianlin, who's chairman and president of Dalian Wanda. So let me actually start with Sir Martin. You've been one of the most visible people in Dalian this week, giving lots of uh, speeches from, from podiums, lots of interviews. You've been one, one, one too many last night, uh, yes, David, so as, you and I, as you and I know. <laughs> it was up till three in the morning editing Reuters copy right. this morning. Well, I could give you a job if you like. <laughs> yeah, if, if the worst comes to the worst, I'll, I'll take you up on that. Yeah. Right, so you've been building your personal brand. You've been right. building the, the brand of, of WPP. And clearly, during this kind of downturn, many companies try to reduce their spend on right. branding, but uh, I would imagine you'd urge them to do the opposite. Why is that? What can, actually, what can branding do to yeah, make well, you successful and pull you out? Thank, thanks, David. Uh, um, it's early in the morning, uh, on a Saturday morning. Um, it's, uh, well, I, I think actually there were, there were three slides that were up there when I uh, walked in uh, from Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, and one of them showed uh, uh, what happens to sales growth to those companies that invest uh, in uh, their brands, in advertising and marketing services, and those companies that don't. Uh, and the simple fact, I mean, if, if, if I say it, or, or one of our, uh, uh, our competitors says it to our clients, we're regarded as being self-interested. Uh, the, the, the data that was up on the slides, on these three slides that you saw, and there were some other elements to it which we'll get into later, was provided by Price, Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, and on my way to Dalian, uh, uh, and in fact India, where I spent a week before coming to Dalian, uh, I saw some data again from uh, the revered consulting company McKinsey & Co. Uh, and I'm sure the same is true at Bain or BCG or Monitor. And that's the simple fact that all the statistical data that you can find show quite clearly that those companies that invest in their brands, uh, invest in advertising and marketing services uh, expenditure at the time of a recession, exit that recession stronger, with greater sales growth, with more profitability, with better margins. If you discount your, your goods, if you reduce your prices, consumers will treat them as commodities. If you invest in your brands, they'll treat them as brands, and you will earn the right to a premium. What's really interesting, and David will be well aware of this as, he, as editor-in-chief at, at Reuters, Thomson Reuters, he, he looks at the company results that we've seen, for example, in the first quarter and the second quarter. David said uh, all the boardrooms are, are looking at cost and going to their core. I, I would agree particularly with the first part of that. The Pavlovian reaction, the instinctive reaction to a recessionary environment is to cut costs. And I just make the simple statement that there is a finite limit to what you can do on costs. You can't cu cut your costs to growth and recovery. But until you get to 100% market share, at least in theory, there is no limit to what you can do on the revenue side. 
And, and as I say, all the apocryphal evidence, all the statistical evidence points to that. The problem is that we're all human beings and we all react to the pressures that we are under. The institutional shareholders, private equity shareholders, doesn't matter whether it's private or public, even family companies, often take a short-term, quarter-to-quarter approach. Often the incentives by which, and I'm not just talking about quantitative, I'm talking about qualitative incentives that people received are based on short-term performance. And strategy takes a back seat, particularly at times like this. So I, I think there are two things that you have to do. Uh, and you look at the results, as I say, of companies, they, they've all really kept their sales stable and where they made their increases in profitability or main profitability, maintain profitability is taking down cost. You have to focus on cost. I'm not denying that. But at the same time, you have to focus on strategy. Well, thanks for that. Actually, Mr. Miyuchi, could you maybe give us some perspective from the, the Japanese experience? Japan, of course, have had 20 or so difficult years, and yet there are Japanese companies which have been very successful during that time. How, how do, what's the best strategy there? I think uh, I still remember 20 years ago uh, quite vividly. At that time, uh, Japan faced a uh, real problem because of the bubble burst. After bubble burst, as most J Japanese, especially manufacturing sector, could find out the market outside of Japan. There's a huge market outside of J Japan, so that uh, they could go out and sell a good product and enlarge market, uh, and also uh, uh, establish their uh, brand in the Europe and the US. Especially, that is very clear uh, if you uh, see Japanese auto manufacturers and uh, electronics uh, manufacturers. They did a uh, great job uh, after the uh, bubble burst in Japan. So that uh, Japan as a country could maintain a uh, level of GDP uh, just around uh, in between 5 and 5.5 trillion dollar level, we have not uh, shown any sharp decline of the GDP. Uh, we maintain the level. Uh, so that we, Japan is still number two uh, uh, country in the world. Uh, probably I think China will uh, soon uh, uh, become a number two, but uh, I think Japanese uh, uh, had a market and uh, we, we can develop market at that time. This time, we found out this uh, problem is uh, not only uh, limited to Japan, but it's all over. So we can, uh, maybe in the last uh, one year, I think even a Japanese company could not find out a new market. So that uh, what they do is uh, did was uh, uh, to reduce uh, uh, capacity and uh, reduce expenses, expenditures, and uh, try to uh, face uh, difficulties. But at the same time, they are now uh, trying to find out new market. That is Asia. Asia is becoming a huge market for the Japanese company, and also a new horizon for the entire economy, world economy, that we have to cope against the global warming problem. This is going to give opportunities for the Japanese companies, because Japan could be a center for the research and development for the, uh, those new products that we must uh, introduce to the market, new services, new product and new technologies. So that uh, Jap Japanese company now are focusing more to the uh, how to develop new product and, uh, to, to meet those uh, new uh, demand. And also, we can combine those new demand with this uh, growing market in Asia. So I think we are in a process of the how to uh, adjust to this uh, second <laughs> uh, big uh, recession for, for the uh, majority of the Japanese corporations. Well, well, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to uh, pick up the point about uh, the different markets and how, from your experience, companies should approach a, a global situation with maybe a, a, a variegated strategy? Yeah, sure, David. Um, and just picking up the, on some of the earlier points that were being made, I think it's quite interesting from our perspective. We're an outsourcing company, so we tend to ask companies to make decisions about what work to send us and how to save money. And remarkably, in a time of recession and downturn, when you would expect decision-making to 
increase in speed, it actually slows down. Mm. And so it actually means that many companies somewhat get paralyzed and decision making actually stops or slows down to a point and it demonstrates a lack of leadership perhaps in many cases in terms of what you should expect should be greater speed, faster decision making, if you're going to take costs out, you should do it faster. If you're going to expand market share, you should do it faster. And yet, things slow down at a time of recession, which is when you need velocity the most. I think that's one. I think two, you know, what we call the peanut butter strategy is applied a little too much, um, which is spread it wide and thick and fast everywhere. So if you're going to take headcount down, let's take it down everywhere, regardless of the fact that headcount in the US perhaps costs you know, 10 times what headcount may cost in Asia, uh, in parts of Asia. Uh, if you're going to take down advertising costs or uh, branding costs, as Martin was talking about, you know, again, you take them down universally as opposed to saying, where do I need to gain market share? Where can I get a bigger piece of the market because some other competitor in that regional market is suffering much more, and therefore I have an opportunity which I've never had before? And where do I, in fact, take costs out because in that market I need to preserve my position and increase profitability. The world is radically different despite all attempts to couple it completely. Markets are radically different as we have found out. There is no point not investing in emerging markets which are seeing good strong growth even in this environment and applying the same strategy here as you might apply in Spain or Germany where the issues are radically different. I think the other element I would just point out is that it is an enormous opportunity to reset the bar. And I think smart companies always reset the bar. They reset the bar in terms of culture. You know, there are things you can do in a time of recession which you couldn't do earlier. Organization silos can be broken, organizational structures can be changed, and things you've been waiting and dying to do for years because of entrenched bureaucracy are things you can take on. But more than that, for instance, it's a great time to hire outstanding talent. Um, you know, across the world, most companies are going to find that they can pr probably acquire better talent today mm -hmm. than they could five years ago. Mm -hmm. And therefore, again, along with brand, it is a time to go out and change your organization around, improve it, reset the bar for culture, and very importantly, not apply this peanut butter strategy of doing the same thing across the world because that's not a strategy. I mean, that's, fairly, uh, that's frankly a failure of, of yes. thought leadership right. rather than right. strategy. Well, thanks for that. Uh, Wang Jianlin, maybe we should go to you because you have not had a peanut butter strategy. You have concentrated here in Dalian. Uh, is mm. that the recipe for success, to concentrate on a place like Dalian mm. and, and, and do that very, very well? Or do you have ambitions to spread elsewhere? And if so, how would you then take your success from here to make it national, regional, or global. Uh -huh, okay. Just now, several uh, fellow panelists have made a very good point. In my opinion, one crisis hit, reducing capacity and uh, cutting costs are not the best means to deal with crisis. I can share with you some of my personal experience. We have experienced two previous crises. One was from 1959 to 1964. The second was from 1994 to 1986. Actually, the previous two crises were much more serious than this one. In the 1990s crisis, a lot of companies failed, but during that period, we didn't simply cut our marketing costs or uh, reduce our uh, capacity. Instead, at the time, we uh, proposed three promises to the country. First, we promised to the people that the buildings we built are of solid quality, and we will compensate for uh, any quality defect. Second, customers within two months of purchase can return the apartments they uh, buy and get a full refund if they're not happy with the apartment. 
And thirdly, that we will provide very good service. You know, well, these measures greatly boosted our sales performance. So in the economic downturn at the time, we were very successful, and our apartments were selling very well at very good prices. And that was the point which made us able to go to other provinces in China. Currently, we are one of the biggest property developers in China, particularly in the area of hotel and the shopping mall development sector, we are among the top. So uh, this lesson has told me that in time of downturn, instead of uh, thinking only about cutting costs and uh, reducing capacity, the focus should be on uh, process re-engineering and uh, new uh, innovation. Vivek, why don't you finish up in this, uh, uh, this first stage? I think uh, you should really talk about the role of innovation and the role of technology because we are, I know you believe, in a, in a time when we're in a sea change. Right. And, uh, and so innovation, I think, is, pretty, is probably crucial. Yeah, yeah, David, we have a saying in uh, Silicon Valley that uh, in a strong wind, even turkeys can fly. And uh, the question is, what happens when the wind stops? Uh, and what I would uh, hypothesize is that it would be dangerous uh, for us to blame everything on the financial crisis. We can sit here and say that the banks caused this and that's why we're in this situation. Uh, what I believe is that we're actually witnessing a sea change and that the 21st century didn't actually begin in the year 2000, but it has just begun in the last year. Uh, and you see the signs. There's more cell phones now sold than landlines. Uh, there's uh, more laptops uh, than desktops. Uh, and so you really have to examine uh, what business you're in uh, and if you're doing uh, the right things. And if you just keep uh, paving a cow path and doing the same things over and over again, then this is a good time uh, to rethink that strategy. So I believe that this is a uh, fantastic time uh, to be an innovator, to innovate. Uh, and if you look at uh, the Fortune 500 companies uh, in the United States, uh, ironically, uh, many household names were actually started in times of crisis. GE was started uh, during the Long Depression, 1876. HP at the uh, tail end of the Depression. Uh, FedEx during the oil crisis. Uh, so I believe that it's a great time to innovate. Uh, Pramod made the point that uh, this, there's no better time to hire good people than now. Um, I believe that uh, in times of crisis, customers uh, are willing to actually try new things. Uh, and in some ways, um, uh, so Martin made the point about brand, uh, but for a company like mine, which competes against very big companies, uh, the playing field is somewhat leveled. And the focus is, is more on value. Uh, and so, uh, so value, hiring good people, uh, really thinking about your business, uh, I believe it's a good time to innovate, uh, and history shows that. Well, there's one thing about innovating within a company. There's another thing about dealing with the innovations around us. And one thing I'd like to ask the, the whole panel about is uh, the role of social media and how consumers' relationship with their companies that they do business with is changing quite dramatically. Uh, do you have any views about how that changes the role of success? Martin, do you want to start? Yeah. I, I I mean, one of the things we noticed is that the rise of social media, which is really uh, an, a technologically advanced way of writing letters to one another. I mean, we used to write letters to one another. We don't do that much anymore. So we use social media. That's one of the alternatives. And social media is what I would call a pure environment. It's uh, what consumers regard as being an untainted environment where they communicate their preferences, their ideas, their experiences, their feelings, their emotions, in a way, as I say, we used to do in more, more traditional means. Invading that uh, with commercial messages is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, let's take the, the example of probably, with the exception of Twitter, the most famous social media brand, Facebook. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, extremely young, uh, young man, successful at a very early age, probably knows more about social networking than most, if any, on the planet, and yet makes mistakes. Uh, the, beak, the introduction of Beacon and then a, a more recent experiment and the immediate withdrawal of that and change of that 
uh, and, and the other thing that I'm referring to, uh, meant that you know, invading these environments with commercial messages is a dangerous thing to do. Consumers don't want uh, overt invasion. So these social media are what I would call public relations media. Uh, we have a number of public relations networks. It's interesting that in this recession, they have, not, they have been more recession resistant and certainly later stage affected than they would be before. Hitherto, for example, in the 2000-2001 internet bust, PR, where a lot of the money had been invested, uh, was the first to suffer. Now, because of polling techniques and statistical techniques, and because of social networking, it's a much more important medium. It does have severe ramifications for people trying to build corporate brands, uh, consumer brands, B2B, business to business or business to consumer, and managing these communities and responding to these communities, more importantly, proactively, not reactively, uh, is critically important and has become uh, another medium that you, that you have to consider. But I would divide the networking, the social networking into two. There's what I would call public relations dominated media, media like Twitter and Facebook. And then there are media that are much more uh, advertising friendly in, the, in a more conventional sense. And that would be MySpace and YouTube where the battle now will be and is, as you see from Rupert Murdoch's uh, activity, Google's activity with the film studios, to find content that consumers like you and I are willing to pay for. And that's going to be the next battle. Just going to just say uh, uh, just one other thing. In this recession, I think there is a remarkable difference between what I would call founder-led companies and founder-controlled companies. It goes back to the points made about speed by Pramod. Uh, I think it is true that it's a slow up in decision making, but in those companies where the span of control mm -hmm. uh, or control is, uh, is significant and the, the spans are lower, you see a speed of response that is much faster. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's quite interesting that these companies have an advantage. Uh, the paralysis mm -hmm. occurs in the, the publicly quoted companies That's buffeted by Sarbanes-Oxley, <laughs> buffeted by recessions, buffet, buffeted by fear. I mean, if you're a non-executive director on a public company, I mean, if you're on the G board, I think you get $250,000, $300,000 a year. Get, even at those levels, which are much greater than a non-executive on, on WPP, who probably gets about 60 or 70,000 pounds a year, despite that, it's not enough to compensate you for the risk. The risk and right. why take a risk? So owner-led companies, owner-controlled companies, I think have a spectacular advantage at this particular point in time. Well, that's, in one speech you managed to talk about modern technology and old-fashioned <laughs> means of organization. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, any, 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 any comments on, uh, on, on, on those points? I, I would add a couple of thoughts to that. Um, and I think the points are you know, wonderfully made. Um, I think the differences that exist regionally are profound mm -hmm. still. If you look at internet penetration and access to things like Facebook and YouTube and all of those things in many countries such as China and India and many countries we operate in, Mexico, Latin America, it's tiny. It's still, the penetration is tiny. And therefore, you again have to think about how you're going to reach out to a completely different mass of population, how you're going to access them, how they're going to, how they're going to talk to you, how you're going to talk to them back and forth. And therefore, how are you going to preserve your brand at a time when, you know, also your access to um, people is very confused, frankly. And I think the biggest challenge many of us face in, when we work in many emerging markets is, how do we provide access? Today, for instance, you know, interestingly, we hire a lot of people. We have 40,000 people around the world. And we hire them, the, one of the mediums they still use is radio. You know, as opposed to getting onto YouTube and everything else, and one of the instruments we tend to use is radio. So I think it's different strokes again, and I think you've got to be very conscious of that. I think the speed point is, is interesting. Apart from non-executive directors, what also happens, uh, as, as I'm sure Martin knows, is in the organizations, in big multinational organizations with lots of fat and lots of room and lots of uh, bureaucracies and layers, you know, the first instinct is going to be job self-preservation. That's what it's going to be. 
It's not really about how do I respond to the crisis. Yes, of course, there's a leadership team, but remember at mid-level, there are many people who are genuinely going to get very concerned. So it's, person, it's personal success it is. and personal survival. And personal survival. Yeah. And you've got to figure out how do you make sure that personal survival is not threatened in a way that prevents people from actually working with speed and doing what they need to do. So that, that's an interesting thought, the, the contradiction between personal success and corporate success, Absolutely. personal survival and corporate success. Well, you know, when we, we were, again, we're in the outsourcing business. So for us to walk into a company and say, you know, why don't you send us all your work and very often we're going to be talking to the person who may lose their, job. lose their jobs. I mean, how do, you, how do you balance that or how do you make sure that one doesn't get in the way of the other or you protect both? Vivek, you look like you have a thought on this one. Well, I, first of all, I want to second what So Martin said. You know, we obviously represent a founder-led company and we've grown our earnings per share 40% during this time and uh, taken on new markets and uh, been very, very successful. Uh, and in many ways, if you're a, a public high-tech company CEO, it's actually easier to manage during uh, times of stress. Uh, expectations are low, and so it's easy to exceed yeah, expectations. Uh, uh, the scarcest resource is people, and you can hire good people. Uh, people are willing to try new things, uh, things that you know that you needed to do that you might not have been able to do during uh, boom times. Uh, it's hard to convince people to change when things are going well. Right. Uh, so in many ways, um, this is a fabulous time to, uh, to restructure your company. And if you look at the history of uh, business, uh, the whole concept of a corporation is actually, in, in the scale of human history, a new concept. So in the 10,000 years of human civilization, we've only had corporate structures as we have today but for about 100 years. Uh, and so one has to continuously ask, uh, what, what does that mean? And with the web, uh, is it back to the future? Are we leveling the playing field? Uh, so that it becomes easier for, uh, for people uh, to, uh, to compete. Uh, so I think it's, it's a good time uh, to be questioning uh, and uh, uh, really not just blaming everything on the economy. Uh, Mr. Wong, can you tell us about the speed of decision making b within Wanda? Can you take decisions very quickly and is that something that uh, helps you in this kind of economy? Well, all Chinese companies make very quick decisions because Chinese companies are not big. There are very few Chinese Fortune 500 companies. Bureaucracy is not prevalent in China. Apart from uh, state-owned enterprises, the majority of uh, private companies are founder-led companies. Founders are still there. For these companies, they have a very short decision-making process. It's pretty easy to come to decision. One dis disadvantage is that uh, they don't have a sufficient consideration of risks. Well, in the Chinese market, you would see that uh, 10 years ago, a worker in a company might be working 10 years later, uh, driving bands in a very luxurious office building. In ever-changing market environment, we have abundant opportunities. In such an environment, if you make decisions in a very slow fashion, if you take the European and the US way of doing things, doing investigation, formulating a report, waiting for the decision of the board of directors until half a year later, you will miss lots of opportunities. In China, you have to be fast. Only fast companies can prevail in competition. Now, Mr. Yi, the Japanese have a reputation for having rather slow decision making. Do you feel that that's a, a, a in comparison, is that, is, is that a problem or do you, how do you compensate for that? I must admit uh, you are right to some extent. <laughs> but uh, in case of a Japanese company, I think maybe uh, the decision making is in the process of sort of a, a bureaucratic way uh, or maybe bottom up uh, style. So that once a decision is made, uh, I think Japanese uh, company could move mm. quite decisively. So that, that uh, it may be uh, time consuming, but uh, the to total energy you spend uh, for the one uh, subject, m might you, you can save by taking some time until you get the uh, uh, decisions. Uh, about uh, branding, uh, Samatin mentioned that if I add what happening in the Japanese market is uh, now I see the uh, power of consumers, 
um, tied with the government and also media become so strong. So, and that, that is a social movement. At the same time, uh, many companies make mistakes. Once you, you find out some mistakes is uh, found, you must apologize to the public uh, very quick. Yeah. Otherwise, you will lose uh, real power of branding. And it, it is very difficult to reconstruct uh, that, is again, that again. Yeah, yeah, just, can, just want to add one thing, David. A, a, apart from sort of control, so if you have A shares, you know, Rupert Murdoch, 40% voting enables, I think, uh, him to exercise tremendous influence quickly over the company. But there's one other dynamic, well, there must be other dynamics at work, but uh, one other thing that's very fundamental, and that is legacy companies. Th those people like ourselves at WPP who have traditional structures and traditional businesses, and you see it at its sharpest, I mentioned uh, Rupert Murdoch and News Corp in the media ownership industry. You have people in the newspaper industry who fell trees and distributed newsprint, which is not uh, an economically sensible thing to do when you think about the process, as you well know. And there's the cost of editorial on top of that. When you look at your Kindle or you look at your Blackberry or you look at digital forms of communication, those are for, far more efficient. Literally, by the press of a button, you can communicate around the world almost instantly. The world has changed. The struggle, the problem for a legacy company, somebody who has, and let's use the car industry as an example. A lot of focus on GM and Chrysler going into bankruptcy. Ford has managed to differentiate itself and position itself separately, but is challenged. Even the Japanese companies, even Toyota, which is the paragon of virtue that we always point to in the automobile industry, is challenged. Where are the new challenges coming from? It's coming from what I call the white sheet of paper companies, the startups, the nano, Rattan Tata's nano, the Geely here, you know, uh, uh, going, to, going to launch a, a sedan, a four-door sedan on the American market at under $10,000 or whatever it is. Uh, the the Chabols, uh, the, the Korean companies, Hyundai, much more revolutionary uh, in its approach, uh, in a way the Samsung of the automobile industry. So legacy, you know, history, plays a big role. The Chinese companies that Chairman just referred to have a spectacular advantage in that they are not hidebound by tradition and legacy systems. Yeah, David, in fact, uh, listening to Chairman Lee, he sounded like uh, somebody in Silicon Valley. So, uh, we have an expression in the Valley, fail fast. Uh, and so it's all about moving quickly, and if something doesn't work, uh, change. And uh, uh, the old model is uh, to take one shot on goal. You know, line up all your resources, do the planning, do the reports. Uh, and of course, the new model is take many shots on goal. Uh, so it's uh, very fascinating to listen to uh, him describe uh, what happens in China. Well, I know where the next challenges for this panel will come from, and that's from the audience. I'd like to now to uh, ask you if you have questions for the audience or a short, sharp comment you'd like to make. Please, no speeches. Uh, but uh, we would like to get you involved and hear your views on uh, the, the topic uh, about how you can be successful uh, in this time and how you avoid mere survival. So yes, so, uh, first in the, uh, the second, or the third row there, please. Do we have a mic microphone? I have a question for the uh, panelists. Usually when we talk about big companies, we uh, usually talk about the uh, slowdown of decision uh, process when a company gets too big. However, Mr. Wang mentioned that the Chinese companies are still fast in decision making. How can you make sure that even when the company is very big, the resources can still be efficiently allocated, the decision making is fast and very relevant to the market? How do you uh, build the corporate structure to ensure the fast decision making? As I said just now, the um, period of uh, c 
commercial society in China is very uh, short, so we don't have the binding of the tradition, the binding of legacy, and uh, don't have the binding of the big brothers. So the Chinese young people are fearless. They are not afraid of uh, Microsoft or other uh, big companies. Everybody wants to be a hero. And the two decades of China's experience has shown so long as you have the courage, so long as you can do it, you can be successful. We can say it's a turbulent time, and you know, uh, heroes arise amidst turbulence. But in mature markets, the uh, markets are basically already monopolized and dominated by uh, huge companies, and then it's pretty hard to uh, rise. Then you asked about uh, the uh, reason why we could still. Uh, maintain faster decision-making process when company is big. Well, each year I will have a meeting. This meeting is targeting at finding problems with big companies because I'm in constant fear. I'm always worried that as my company grows, my company will slow down and will be clumsy because maybe uh, very soon my company is big. It will take me half a year to make a decision. So, you know, each year I will have a meeting at which everybody points out problems and how to uh, prevent the uh, big company syndrome. And of course, it's not that we uh, totally lose sight of risks. We uh, definitely still need to have uh, proper risk control. For instance, we have an investment committee, and we need to have the majority vote to uh, make investment in the project. Hey, I'd be happy to. I think I'm going back to my experience with GE, you know, when we saw Welch really take on um, and build what was certainly in those days one of the best companies in the world. Um, and I was there for 25 years. But the, the point about you know, speed is, is critical for big companies because as companies are big, they become size and scale means risks get accentuated and increased and you need to manage them carefully and you need to delegate a lot more and you need to manage the process of delegation a lot more. But some of the informality that we can maintain, so I'm going back to Martin's point, you know, what Kindle and others can do for you, you need to try and maintain that spirit in your company. Fast communication across the board, across all levels, the ability to reach out into the depths of your company, different regions, different markets very quickly. Uh, simplicity, clarity, just very clear messages. We do this, we don't do this. We're good at this, we don't, we're not good at this. We're gonna try and do this, we're not gonna try and do that. Just very simple, clear messages so that you know, there's no confusion across the company as to who we are and what we're trying to do, etc. And then the willingness to try, I, I, I love Vivek's point of fail fast. Willingness to try, make errors, try it, it'll fail. You'll make 20 mistakes, but you move forward fast. And I think building up that culture through informal direct communication, and certainly today's tools are very valuable for that kind of indirect, uh, uh, informal communication, I think really help build that culture of speed. Martin, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I, I do think, um, you know, just, the historical point that Chen Wang just mentioned, uh, China has a massive advantage because of its domestic market. Uh, there are 1.3 billion people uh, with, that we know of in China, there may be more. This is uh, unprecedented in terms of, the opportunity is unprecedented in terms of economic expansion. Just to remind you know, America that that is uh, four, almost four times more, four, more than four times more, the population in the United States. And just to make a point uh, where it's dangerous for me to disagree with a client's client like Pramod, but let me just say this. Uh, China is a well-developed new media market. There are 338 million internet users here, which is bigger already than the population of the United States. There are 700 million mobile users, 500 million people of which one and two thirds the size of the, the United States are on one operating network. Uh, the new media opportunity is very significant so in this market. Too. So China has a unique example. To the point about what do we poor companies in the, in the West do to respond, I think you have to have a clear vision or strategy. 
you have to have a structure to implement it, and you have to communicate it, as you just said, Prama, uh, in terms of uh, very, very clearly. You can keep these units small. There are diseconomies of scale in our business, and we intentionally try and keep Mm. fragment mm. the organization and network it because technology enables you to do that mm. in a way and focus you mentioned GE mm -hmm. you know we can all debate a wonderful company fantastically successful you were an important part of the success until you bought out one of its successful uh, pieces and made it even more successful but focus I think is important as well uh, the era of the conglomerate I mean the true conglomerate yes uh, the diversified business is, is, is I think, uh, not gone, but it is to some extent discredited. There's a question here in the front row. Thank you, moderator. The panelists have uh, offered excellent uh, discussion. They are truly leaders of the industry. My question is that would all panelists uh, summarize concisely their success experience or the three most important measures they've taken to lead their company to success amidst downturn? The three most important measures. Uh, sure. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is that uh, everything that has been done can be done better. And uh, that really comes down to innovation. And so if you look at uh, the history of business, uh, people made shoes for years, and Phil Knight came along and uh, you know, he, made, he started a shoe company. You know, we had uh, people with search engines, and who would have thought that yet another search engine would succeed? Uh, so the first uh, bit of advice I have is uh, uh, just everything can be done better. You know, there's nothing out there that can't be done better. When I, even when I look at the internet, uh, to me it's the world's biggest legacy system. Uh, and somewhere out there, I, I don't know if it's in <laughs> Beijing or Bombay or Boston or Bangalore, but somewhere out there somebody is going to do something that's going to put these guys out, uh, make them a has-been. Uh, the, the second thing I, I would say, and I know this sounds uh, obvious, uh, but um, one common trait you'll find in successful companies is they hire really, really smart people. Uh, and I've, in my own case, surrounded myself with people a lot smarter than me, and uh, uh, that's, uh, that's been a good, uh, a good strategy. So, so go out there and hire people uh, that are really, really smart. And, and number three is what I said earlier, that uh, don't be afraid to take uh, risks. Uh, the, you know, the earlier question was a very, very good question, and uh, the fact is most of, many companies will fail. You know, many companies out there will fail. Uh, and perhaps Sir Martin has the, uh, said it right when he said that uh, the common ingredient is that you have a founder uh, that's still leading the company, and a great example of that is Apple. You know, Apple was uh, left for dead when Steve Jobs came back, and uh, uh, look at all the things that he's invented uh, since, uh, since that time. And what's really, really hard is uh, to, uh, the expression is to eat your own children, to cannibalize your own business. Uh, and so don't be afraid to, uh, to take chances uh, and do things that could even uh, hurt you in the short term. Mr. Mir, what are you doing? Yes. I'm in the financial service industry, and uh, first thing for us, most importantly, is uh, how to observe the real situations. If you uh, recall 12 months, uh, People could not understand in, the, in this understand in, in this industry what happened. Uh, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, and uh, huge lending institutions were helped by the government. This is the first ex experience for the everybody. So what we need as a manage, manager of the company was uh, to observe what what is really happening. That is number one uh, consideration I, I had. Second thing is you have to. Uh, come up with the right decision to cope against these uh, difficulties. Uh, you don't have to have a, a quick uh, decision. Rather, you have to have a right reaction to these uh, difficulties so that you must be very, very careful to watch all sorts of movement throughout the industry and also the movement of the government. 
The last thing you have to do is uh, within the organization, you have to work as a team, not as a uh, top-led uh, organization that uh, like uh, military forces. Rather, you have to unite w willingness of the people and uh, uh, organize good team to cope against this uh, difficulty. Thank you. In the second row. Hello, wait. Uh, hello, uh, Luo Zhen from Oriental Morning Post in Shanghai. Uh, we have five successful entrepreneurs here. So uh, can you share some of your experience in China? Uh, as we know, China is making a successful uh, to move out of the economy downturn. So uh, are you satisfied with the performance of your business in China this, this year? What kind of opportunities you have uh, seized here? And what, what kind of difficulties you have met in the past eight months? Thank you. Okay, well, uh, Pramod, why don't we start with you since you're uh, sure. here in Dalian with sure. 3,000 people. You can tell a little bit of your, your, your sure. individual experience here. Sure, be happy to. We, we started in Dalian in 2000, <clears throat> and I guess we were amongst the first of the IT and software and business process services uh, guys to be here. And we started serving Japan from Dalian. And since then, of course, uh, you know, history, history for Dalian has been written in many aspects, including prices of real estate and everything else that has gone up uh, substantially. That part has been very successful. I think the part where we have not been as successful, and that's really as much due to our own efforts as it is our own investment, I think, as much as it is due to the market, is really working with the domestic market to build up a really strong, big, viable services, IT, technology, back office, business process reengineering, services market in China. Why? Because the market is, I think, a little unaware of what we do. We haven't made the investments we need to. Uh, it's a little opaque. It's a little hard to understand, understand all the networks, understand who to connect with, who to talk to, etc. But I think it remains a phenomenally uh, a huge opportunity, and clearly, I think, over time, will be extremely successful. So for the overseas market, it has been very successful, but for the domestic market, I would say less successful than perhaps we would have liked it to be. But I think a lot of that is us as opposed to the local market. Martin, can we turn to you? I know China's been a bright spot for you. Yeah, um, I, maybe I just link the, 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 t the two questions. Um, I mean, uh, I get very scared when I hear that you think the internet is a, is a legacy system. We're having difficulty <laughs> dealing with the right. internet. God knows what's coming from <laughs> Bangalore or Beijing. Yeah. Um, but let me, let me just feed off some things that Pramod said in his uh, opening, opening piece. And on, on the three things that just very simply, uh, what we're doing strategically, and we have not been successful uh, in, in the downturn. We found it very difficult in the first six months of this year, including, I would say, lead growth markets such as India and China. But with that, with, with that caveat, there are three things. New, new markets, that's what I would define as the BRICS and the next 11. So Brazil, Russia, India, China. I might even call it BRICI. I might add Indonesia to that. But places in the next 11, such as Vietnam, Bangladesh, Pakistan, mm. Mexico, Turkey, South Africa is not in Goldman Sachs's next 11, but I'd add that in. So those markets, that's number one. Secondly, new media. Uh, the internet in the form of PC, mobile, and video content is changing the form and face, as you saw from that data from Price Waterhouse of our industry. And last but not least, consumer insight. Understanding what, how consumers are changing in this environment, how corporate consumers, even in the business-to-business -business area, are changing uh, is critically important. On China, as, as David said, it's a very important business to us. It, we have uh, our revenues worldwide are about 14 billion US. Uh, we have about 900, 950 million here in China. We have about 11 and a half thousand people here uh, out of a total uh, direct workforce of 105,000 people. So China has been very significantly important. I, I would say the key issue in China for us, and we've had uh, a wonderful 20 years here. Uh, we've been here longer than 20 years, but in 1989, we had our first WPP board meeting here in Guangzhou. Uh, and I remember it very well, for four years after the, the famous Deng Xiaoping speech, uh, we, we decided strategically to make China front and center uh, of our strategy along with India and the other BRICS and Next 11 markets. Uh, and we've had uh, a, a, 
really wonderful experience in a market that we have a tremendous admiration for and respect for uh, in terms of the talent that is here uh, and the, the talent that will be here because the talent opportunity is very significant. The one comment I would make in terms of difficulty is that China is underbranded. I know, again, I'm talking my own book, but if you look at the statistics as the proportion of advertising and marketing services as a proportion of GNP, like India, which is even, even more underbranded than China, China is relatively underbranded. And the reason for that is twofold. Firstly, in the domestic markets, Chinese manufacturers still don't, I think, fully understand the importance of consumer connection, either tangible or emotional. They are still consumed with awareness rather than what we call in our vernacular bonding, consumer bonding. Developing a close relationship with the consumer is critically important and building the value of brands. That is starting to develop with companies such as Yili and Hire, Mongolian Cow, etc. You're starting to see that increasingly. China Mobile uh, are examples of companies that are starting to understand that, but it still has a way to go. The other point is, as Chinese companies diversify, not diversify, expand internationally, the importance of global brands will become even critical. We've seen it already. I mentioned China Mobile. Lenovo is a classic example. It is critically important for Lenovo to build its brand uh, on a worldwide basis. So as Chinese companies exhaust the opportunities domestically and start to think increasingly about building brands around the world, and I think it's eight of the top 30 brands are Chinese banks um, already. So already this phenomenon. China Mobile, according to our valuation survey, is the fifth or sixth most valuable brand in the world and the most valuable brand in the world outside the United States. So it's already happening. Mm. It will happen more mm. and Chinese companies will have to invest more, not just in innovation, which all the panelists I think have underlined, but branding too. Mm. Great, there's a question third row. My name's Dave Sine. I'm with Fleischmann Hillard Global Communications. Sir Martin, thank you for uh, calling out our client Lenovo as a great example of global it's, branding. It's ours as too. You, I appreciate ours too. That. You, 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 you can't get away with that one. Uh, Pramod, I think we also owe you a debt of thanks for uh, reminding us that with all the attraction of social media that still a lot of other media out there and the convergence of media is really uh, a topic that everyone in this room should be thinking about um, and that everyone in this room has a unique media consumption profile that we have to tune into. So um, I really appreciate that. And um, yes, so could, could you, sorry, could you get to the question? Yeah, it underscores the importance of integration of all of the communications channels. And I was wondering if the uh, panel would like to talk about that with respect to brand building. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, who'd like to take that, uh, that one first? But the, uh, uh, my, my simple point on it is we're very confused, so that's yeah. why we, I guess we need help. But I think the <laughs> convergence or integration is, is on pieces of paper rather than in reality. And therefore, the confusion that we have is that people who are good at one thing are often not necessarily very good at the other thing. Markets are radically different. I think Martin is, is absolutely right. China is radically in a different space than many other markets we employ people in and therefore our ability to reach out not just to employees but also to customers in those markets is radically different and therefore strategies are very different and yet expertise is not easily available to integrate the two. So uh, from our perspective, I, I have no wisdom to offer other than questions to ask. Like, you would. Well Vivek, you, you, your business is bringing, making, making disparate systems talk to one another so you're uh, your view on convergence is probably interesting. Yeah, from our perspective, there's a lot of money to be made in that, and so <laughs> the more confusing it is, the better. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I do, I do think that uh, you know this also goes back to the earlier question a little bit. That there's, from our perspective, there's three ways in which uh, China has been great for us, and the first two are obvious. The, we obviously have people in China, and they uh, they've done very well for us in terms of development and and so on. And the second is China does represent a market and we're starting to do better at that. Uh, but over time, I believe it could be number three that could actually be the biggest uh, 
source of value for us and uh, answer some of the questions that were raised, which is we're finding that uh, learning how to adapt technology to the Chinese market uh, ends up actually being something that's highly applicable uh, back in the Western markets as well. So being able to uh, you know, switch uh, carriers easily, being able to do lots of uh, little uh, transactions, uh, having the platform, having the convergence. Uh, and so uh, our own experience has been that things we're doing in this market are very marketable uh, in, uh, back in the United States and other markets as well. And that could end up being the biggest value in the, sh in the medium term. Martin, a quick word on convergence? Um, on, on integration? On integration, yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, clearly we haven't done our, our job right, uh, uh, given Pramod's res response. Um, we, we really <laughs> should do a better job in terms of integration. I think integration is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. uh, clients are talking in this recession about two, they use two words, effectiveness and efficiency. Effectiveness means better work, better quality work. Efficiency means doing it at lower cost. So clients are basically saying we want the same for less, we want more for the same, or even the same for less. I mean, it, it's, it's or more, for, more for less at the very extreme of the spectrum. Uh, and that's something that uh, you can't fight. The rise of the finance function and procurement function has meant that this has become front and center. But let me just sort of turn on this integration thing. Um, I think that the big advantage that the Chinese have, uh, and we've noticed this uh, over the years, is that unlike uh, many of us in the West, uh, the Chinese listen and learn. I mean, the most remarkable thing about the 20 years that we've been operating here is the ability of the Chinese economy to adapt, to go through significant economic change, opportunity, and challenge. And you know, you, you, you come to China, and people are talking about 7 to 8% growth. And I have to say, India is talking about 6 to 7% growth. We would give our right arm in the UK or the US to be flat. Flat is what we call the new up. And it, it, I know China is, has started from a lower base, but the base is very considerable now. And I think it's fundamentally due to the point that's being made. Uh, whether you call it integration, listening, the ability of the Chinese to, to look at learn, listen, adapt it, implement it, is considerable. And it's an art and a skill that we in the West you know, have lost to some degree, um, and I think we've rapidly got to learn it again. Well, I'd like to thank the audience for listening so intently, <laughs> I th uh, and I'm sure that you learned a lot, because I, I certainly did. I'd like to thank the panel for a lot of very interesting insights on this great topic. I'm afraid we are out of time, so thank you very much. Thank you.